Thank you for the invitation to um, give this lecture on um, current understandings around fat, especially saturated fat, and the cardiovascular disease risk. So this lecture is for the MSc in Preventative Cardiology at Imperial College London, and this is the Nutrition and Weight Management module. When you say the word fat in general, it has a uh, different connotation to different people. Some people think fat is being unhealthy. Other people, depending on the type of industry they're in or the type of diet they eat, they can think of fat as being healthy and preventative uh, of diseases. And there's also the other connotation where when people say the word fat, they associate it immediately with adiposity and uh, the ever-expanding waistline of uh, Western um, countries right now. But generally, <clears throat> when we think of fat from a dietary perspective, it doesn't get a very good rap overall. Um, this is some material used by the British Heart Foundation to um, create awareness around the consequences of fat in the diet, in particular cooking oil, um, deep fried uh, approaches to, to uh, cooking foods. From my perspective, uh, having been involved in fat uh, research uh, and cholesterol research for the last number of years, you have to take fat from both perspectives, both the unhealthy as well as the healthy. And Julia Childs offers us some very useful information about fat as well because it is part of our food systems and without a doubt it does add flavor and um, have other hedonic properties which we find pleasant. Uh, and it does improve foods. So these are some of her quotes related to fat, which I also uh, uh, put some stock in, uh, as I do tend to add a little butter or cream when possible to any of my cooking. But for the average person in our population, there is tremendous mixed signaling around the role fat plays in the development of disease. And some of these tweets that you've just seen and some of these news articles that have popped up um, on this slide will give you some of that um, breath of confusion. Everything from fat is healthy and go ahead and consume it to fat is the most dangerous thing uh, on our plates and we should do everything in our power to avoid it. And then there's every opinion in between. And the problem with these opinions are some of them are very well evidenced and from experts in the area, while others are complete nonsense and based on nothing but pure conjecture or personal opinion. This last article that you see published uh, in the BMJ that's appearing on the slide now, um, this is back in September. This article published by uh, self-described investigative reporter Nina Tailt um, outlined how the American Dietary Guidelines Committee um, got it completely wrong and um, misinformed the public as to the role that fats play in our diet, um, which resulted in tremendous backlash both at the journal as well as the uh, as well as the author of this uh, particular paper this particular report um, for its inconsistencies and its conjecture and actually innuendo regarding the um, impartiality uh, and expertise of the co committee members themselves so it doesn't help because this sort of thing is a lot of press and all people take out of it at the end of the day are usually the sound bites or the headlines or the in quotation uh, clips that you see in the media. So it does hurt uh, people in general uh, by not being able to access the appropriate information about what fat is in our diet and what fats we should be consuming and which ones we should be avoiding. Because generally this is what the average consumer thinks of when they think of fat. They think of fat as being uh, intrinsically present in foods that they consume like this hamburger. Um, they don't see it they certainly taste it and uh, that sort of thing. And they're aware of it, that it's there, especially if, it, if it's showing up on a food label. They're also aware of the fat that they can see. So they can see things that they put into foods when they cook. They can see things that they put into foods that they um, uh, uh, purchase in the store, such as you know some uh, pork rashers here, uh, or if they're purchasing lard, butters, or cooking oil. They can see these fats, and this is what fat means to an average consumer. However, understanding the differences between the fats of um, these types of fats and the properties of these fats is very difficult to communicate in short 
bursts of information to the public where they are able to retain this uh, and apply it to a dietary uh, pattern that they're adopting. So generally, fats are broken up into the three major um, types being saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. And then the polyunsaturated fat being broken down further into a, to those of the omega-6 and omega-3 varieties. In the UK, we consume slightly in excess of the recommended amount of saturated fat in all age and sex groups that were measured in the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. And so we, in the UK, we recommend about 11%, and that's in line with most of the rest of the world where it's at 10% for saturated fat intake as a proportion of total calorie intake, um, not of total fat intake. And just to give an example of how much we're over by, um, 19 to 64 year olds, um, men and women were consuming 12.6% um, of food energy from saturated fat. Most of this coming from milk and milk products, cereals, as well as meats. None of this should be a surprise to you, as these are the foods that contain most of the fat in our diets usually. Um, and these made similar contributions to the children's diets as well, but milk being the top producer there um, under younger children. So the link between diet and cardiovascular disease is not a new one. Some people may think that this is the last 20, 30 years, some maybe think the last 50, but really this data has been around for a long time. Um, initial discoveries as far back as the early 1900s, 1913, here you can see the publication data on this paper, um, were, observed, were made um, by researchers looking for animal models to study diseases like atherosclerosis, which were starting to appear in regular medical literature um, following autopsies to determine causes of death and this sort of thing. Um, and so um, Natalie uh, Atishkow, uh, Anishkow, sorry if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly, was one of the first people to publish findings linking cholesterol in particular um, to the uh, progression of atherosclerosis. And in his particular study where he fed um, uh, rabbits high levels of cholesterol, he was able to observe some immune cells which were phagocytizing, as he put it, the cholesterol that was present and were embedded in the tissue uh, related to the arteries. Now he chose an animal which is particularly susceptible to dietary cholesterol and atherosclerosis. Um, this would have turned out much differently if he had chosen something like a mouse for his model. Um, or uh, some other type of rodent, but he chose rabbit and he saw this and published this observation. And others along the way for the last, say, 100 years have been doing the same thing, have been identifying these in both animal and human um, scenarios and making drawing the link between dietary fat, and in this particular case, cholesterol, and the development of cardiovascular disease. But it became really evident that there was a link between dietary fat, in particular saturated fat, and and cholesterol levels in the late 1960s, early 1970s, with the publication of the Seven Country Study, uh, with the lead investigator being Ansel Keys. So if you're not aware of Ansel Keys, there's some um, uh, good biographical data there at the link you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, and it'll take you to the University of Minnesota's webpage where they have a, a, a nice archive of this particular study and um, Ansel Keys' contributions to nutritional science, which there were, he had many contributions which were um, very important, in particular to the American military um, and their uh, approach to nutrition for soldiers. But this particular study is what gained him fame and obviously the cover of Time magazine. And basically, this study was a very large observational study conducted in seven countries, as, as it states, in diff different populations where they had dietary data. And they looked at the serum cholesterol concentrations as a function of the amount of of sorry, the amount of saturated fat in the diet as a proportion of calories. And what they came up with was quite um, interestingly a very linear relationship, being that those countries that had individuals having lower serum cholesterol tended to be the countries that had lower saturated fat intakes as a proportion of calorie. And at the other end, the opposite being true, where you had high cholesterol levels in the blood linked to high saturated fatty acid content in the diet. And you can see this is one of the graphs from one of the publications that came from this study. So it's not the only study that's done this, but it is one of the most famous and probably one of the most referenced when we talk about the diet cardiovascular disease link. 
Um, but what a key, the key question is that we are still trying to tease apart even today um, is what is the driving relationship between dietary cholesterol, dietary saturated fatty acids, and the resulting increase in blood LDL cholesterol concentrations? Because these are, while when you're speaking of it very generally in a, in a, in a simple discussion, you, you may use some of these terms synonymously, like dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol, meaning that, you know, thinking that they relate directly. However, they really don't. And there's enough evidence to show us that now, that dietary cholesterol, unlike what um, was reported in 1913 by uh, Anand Shishkow, um, dietary cholesterol in humans does not contribute significantly to LDL cholesterol in the blood. And so if it doesn't, how does then the link between dietary cholesterol, dietary saturated fat, contribute to the changes in LDL cholesterol? And this is really what's taken the focus of um, dietary approaches to studying cardiovascular disease for the last 25, 30 years. Um, and if you needed some confirmation uh, beyond my word that dietary cholesterol has no appreciable effect on um, blood cholesterol concentrations, here is a quote from the recent scientific report um, by the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in the U.S., which has now delisted cholesterol as a nutrient of concern. And um, this is the quote saying that uh, you know if there's no need to put limits uh, on people's consumption of cholesterol because the effect of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol concentrations is minimal until you get to the levels that are excessively high and uh, usually unphysiological or not common in the diet um, of the average person. But there is overwhelming data that shows us there is a direct link between cholesterol in the blood and the saturated fatty acids that we consume in our diet. So there is a link here. And the link is directly related to the fact that we have particular systems in place for lipoprotein trans transport throughout the body. We have three systems in particular, the endogenous, the exogenous, and the reverse. These are all cholesterol transport pathways, which deal with cholesterol coming from exogenous sources, being the diet or the gut in general, because there is some um, endogenous uh, cholesterol or cholesterol precursors that end up in our gut and then get reabsorbed. Then there's the endogenous, which is the cholesterol that's produced in our body, other lipids produced in our body, which are need to be transported around. And then there's the reverse cholesterol transport, which is specifically the HDL pathway of removing cholesterol from the periphery and returning it to the liver in an effort to either supply excess cholesterol in, when times are uh, calling for cholesterol to be required at the liver or for a removal system to keep the peripheral tissue safe from excess cholesterol, which is damaging and leads to the propagation of atherosclerosis. So this slide here is showing you some work from James Dietschy and his associates. This work was published in the early 90s, and it was a set of experiments conducted in rodents which really elegantly showed the relationship of both dietary cholesterol and saturated fat uh, to levels of cholesterol and the activity of LDL receptor in the liver. Um, and so it links basically this transport system, this lipid transport system, directly to dietary saturated fat. So to take you through, and just to orientate you to the, to the diagrams that you're seeing here, on the side here, on the left-hand side, you see whole animal LDL receptor activity. So this means the activity of the LDL receptor to remove LDL particles from circulation. If it's high, if the activity level is high, that means you're removing more LDL from circulation. And if the activity is low, you're removing less. Okay. And so what they did was, this is a study uh, where they, if you look here at the x-axis, where they continuously went from zero fat to 20% fat of, by weight in the diet, and they stepwise increase this at, with 5%, up to 20% um, dietary triacylglycerides. And these triacylglycerides were either soybean oil, which is an, uh, rich in uh, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, or hydrogenated corn oil, which uh, was basically hydrogenated to produce a saturated uh, fatty acid structure in the triglycerides. And so what you see here is basically a comparison, a head-to-head -head comparison of a plant-based, not animal-based, so these are cholesterol-free mediums except for where the uh, investigators put cholesterol into the diet. Uh, so these are plant-based oils, one made saturated, one left as a polyunsaturate, and you can see the direct effect that this saturated fat 
has on LDL receptor activity as well as LDL cholesterol production rate. So this is uh, expressed as percent of the control animals. So you see t several um, controls listed here, control and then cholesterol control, control, cholesterol control. So they did do a cholesterol control where they added cholesterol to the diet okay, as well. And so you can see that cholesterol free versus cholesterol in the diet has its own effect. But then when you add on this, the effect of increasing the amount of either uh, polyunsaturated fat or saturated fat, you can see a very distinctly different pattern occurring. And so what you see here is that the polyunsaturated fatty acid rich soybean oil here and here had the effect that LDL receptor was increased, the activity was increased, and the LDL cholesterol production rate was decreased when you compare to the saturated fatty acid rich hydrogenated corn oil which here you can see that the activity actually decreased by about 50 percent and the production rate of LDL cholesterol increased um, by roughly the same amount. So that was a mixed triglyceride what you saw in the last set of data and now this slide is showing you in another set of studies uh, but in, a, in the same model the effect of individual saturated fatty acids and so this is where a lot of confusion for the general public and even for some of the scientific community who is not who don't work in this particular area very specifically get confused around saturated fat and distinguishing dietary saturated fat from the individual components of these individual saturated fatty acids which make up that saturated fat and so what you see here again I'll orientate you on the left you see plasma LDL cholesterol concentrations you see the relative hepatic receptor activity. So this is the LDL receptor activity. And then you see the relative production rate of LDL. So similar data to the slides that you saw before. And down here on the bottom, now this is showing you the effect of um, 6 carbon, 8 carbon, 10 carbon, 12, 14, 16, and 18. Uh, 12, 14, and 16, these are lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid, okay, respectively. 18 is stearic acid. So these are the most popular and most, uh, sorry, not the most popular, but the most abundant saturated fats in our diet. Regardless of what the saturated fat source is, these are the most abundant in that source, and they will be appearing in various uh, or different uh, amounts depending on what particular food you're eating. And so you can see the effects that they have. So on plasma LDL cholesterol concentrations, these three in particular, lauric, myristic, and palmitic, so that's C12, C14, C16, increased LDL concentrations. They decreased the LDL receptor activity. So this gives you a hint as to the mechanism by which the LDL concentrations were increasing because you see a decrease in the activity of the receptor, which is the removal from the blood. And then you also see an increase in the relative production rate, which is um, a combination of both the LDL constant, the LDL particles which are not being removed, the LDL cholesterol not being removed from circulation, as well as the newly produced, which is also entering the plasma. And so you can see here between these two graphs that it is a detrimental effect. But what's interesting to see is that saturated fats C6, 8, and 10, as well as stearic acids C18, are relatively neutral and they don't have any appreciable effect on LDL cholesterol concentrations. So looking at that a little bit differently now and looking specifically at risk factors that we measure in humans, the total HDL cholesterol ratio is the one of the best right now predictors of um, the development of heart disease or uh, cardiovascular diseases in general that we have. And so when you look at exchange models, so in this particular set of graphs, this is a paper by Ronald Mensing um, from University of Maastricht. And this is where he has been modeling the effect of removing or replacing um, various types of fat with one another. And so this is predict changes uh, in the serum total to HDL cholesterol ratio, the LDL and HDL cholesterol concentrations, when you have a 1% change or iso uh, energetic replacement of each of these fatty acids uh, with the other. And so you can see here saturated fatty acids being neutral uh, on the total to HDL cholesterol ratio but their effect on LDL cholesterol is quite high, but they do have the effect where they do increase HDL as well. However, what I should draw your attention to is not so much the fact that the 
saturated fat it has the negative impact or the slightly neutral impact what you do see here is that when you have the cis polys or cis monounsaturated fatty acids you get improved total to HDL cholesterol ratio and this is through both an increase in the HDL as well as a substantial decrease in LDL and so this is the protective effect that we see when we get these recommendations to consume more polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat at the expense of saturated fat and then if we draw this out now <clears throat> more clearly in terms of the food choices that people make so when they're consuming foods and they're looking at the label the food label to see what's in there or they're cons or they're actually purchasing oils or foods that contain fat this is what they're looking at on the uh, grocery store shelves and you can see here if you take the average American dietary fat intake as being zero effect on total to HDL cholesterol ratio and then start substituting at 10% of energy so this is a more realistic substitution uh, if you start substituting coconut fat margarine palm kernel uh, mayonnaise which is also rich in vegetable oils olive oil soybean oil and rapeseed oil you see you get a decrease in the total HDL cholesterol ratio now on the other side of the coin if you start uh, to increase chocolate fat palm fat um, hydro this is basically partially hydrogenated oh, sorry this is basically partially hydrogenated uh, um, vegetable oil margarine uh, shortenings butter and carbohydrate mixed carbohydrate you start to see an increase in the total HDL cholesterol ratio which is negative and increases your risk of developing coronary heart disease so very recently <clears throat> um, there was a uh, prospective cohort study published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology and this is uh, first author is uh, Yanpang Li but this is in conjunction with or in collaboration with Walt Willett and Frank Hugh from Harvard and this study showed two very important um, and modeled two very important outcomes um, that should be uh, considered when you're looking at how to approach dietary advice for individuals or populations groups or even at the level of the individual for reducing your own risk so data that I haven't shown in the slides uh, that was particularly interesting was that if you control for the intake of saturated fat so mixed saturated fat in the diet um, and control for all other factors that contribute to coronary heart disease that there is no strong relationship between saturated fat itself and coronary heart disease um, occurrence now that's not to say that saturated fats are okay because that's basically means that you're no better off it's not saying that you're healthy it means you're no better off than somebody with with five other risk factors by consuming the high levels it's not a protective statement what it just says what it says is is that when you take all other risk factors into account saturated fat contributes very little uh, in comparison to some of the other contributors and some of these other contributors are a history of heart disease in your family uh, high um, uh, refined carbohydrate intake uh, uh, insulin insensitivity so there are numerous uh, covariates that they measured to associate this with and basically what that particular piece of information says is that you have a situation where these components are additive so if you have multiple risk factors they will combine to increase your risk uh, removing two or three individual risk factors may or may not have any substantial effect it's a, it's, a, it's a, a, an all or none approach to lowering risk so it shouldn't be misunderstood which it was however in some tweets that I'd seen and some uh, reporting on the article that saturated fat is fine to eat so don't worry about it that's not what it says at all because what it did show in this particular study was that consuming polyunsaturated fats at the expense of saturated fats reduced your risk tremendously up to 25 to 30 percent reductions you can see it right here in your overall risk of developing cardiovascular diseases when you make a five percent isocaloric exchange with saturated fatty acids okay monounsaturated fatty acids were also healthy uh, and as well as substituting whole grain carbohydrates at 5% of energy for a, for a saturated fatty acid also had a positive effect up to 10% reduction of your overall risk for coronary heart disease so this is very important data which needs to be communicated that it's not a matter of fearing saturated fat 
what it is is that you consume the amount of fat in your diet but you make sure that you're consuming more poly and more MUFA at the expense of saturated fat. And then the study also looked at um, carbohydrates, either refined or whole grain. And they also showed here that if you substitute refined carbohydrates, which I'm sure you've got a lot on in this module so far from some of the other lecturers, uh, if you replace the refined carbohydrate with carbohydrates from whole grain sources, you again get reductions. And so if you have refined carbohydrates, um, this being starches and sugars from simple sources, um, so added sugars, this sort of thing, if you replace 5% of the energy of these simple sugars with polyunsaturated fatty acids, you get about a 20-23% reduction in your overall risk. You get about a 10-12% reduction by just replacing them with whole grains. So this is very important evidence showing you that um, replacement of the more negative or um, the less healthy options in our diet, such as added sugars, refined carbohydrates, saturated fats, replacing these with polyunsaturated fats in terms of the amount of energy they provide or whole grains has an overall protective effect, reducing your risk uh, by a substantial amount. So at the end of the day, all that being said, is there any clear benefit in targeting LDL cholesterol? And how can you target LDL cholesterol to lower your cardiovascular disease risk? Well, the answer to the question of is there a, a direct relationship between LDL cholesterol levels and development of heart disease, yes, there is. So this has been shown and well understood for um, a long time now. Um, but this graph in particular by Scott Grundy, published in 2004, really illustrates that it's a um, very close relationship between LDL concentrations and your relative risk for coronary heart disease. So the lower your LDL concentrations, the lower your risk. It's a changing story though for some of the polyunsaturated fats because for a long time now we've been promoting omega-3 intakes uh, and this is based on some very solid um, clinical and observational data that we've had um, showing that omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid intake does tend to associate with lower cardiovascular disease risk. However, there have been some genetic studies recently that have been exploring changes in groups of people who consume high levels of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid habitually and looking at their actual genetic makeup compared to those individuals who don't consume or haven't traditionally, and by traditionally I mean over, say, the last 25,000 years, high omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. A lot of the positive data surrounding uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid began as early as the uh, late 70s uh, where we saw some landmark studies in the Greenland Inuit compared to um, mainland Danes. And Greenland Inuit, if you're not aware, um, obviously reside in Greenland. They have a high fish diet or marine mammal diet even, uh, which is um, relatively equally balanced in its N6 to N3 ratios. Okay, so you can see here, this is the platelet phospholipid breakdown of EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid. And it's roughly one to one in terms of um, um, the composition. And this is directly reflective of their diet because these poly, um, these phospholipids change in relationship in relation to the dietary fat that's consumed because these are essential fatty acids and essential fatty acids tend to be conserved in our body we have we have mechanisms in place to conserve them that's why they're that's why they're and they're mainly conserved in phospholipids as opposed to adipose because adipose is used as an energy source whereas phospholipids are functional and phospholipids being present in all cells then provide a reservoir for essential fatty acids to be liberated and used in metabolic pathways and so if you look at the Inuit, roughly a one-to-one -one ratio across the board here for these N6 and N3 um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. But you look at the westernized Danes living in Denmark, and you see that it's tremendously swayed towards the N6 side of the uh, equation here. This is, again, their platelet phospholipids. And then if you look at a functional test referred to as the clotting time, so this is, ex this is how many minutes it will take their blood to form a solid clot, you can see here that the Daneland Inuits have about it takes their blood roughly three minutes longer to clot. And this is a functional test related to um, uh, properties of both the platelets, but also the clotting factors and this sort of thing. And we know that clotting factors and um, uh, platelet aggregation is directly related to uh, the later stages of development of coronary heart and other cardiovascular diseases. 
So and then some background data, some epidemiological data on these Greenland Inuit is that they have about a 10 times lower incidence of heart attack and stroke. They tend to have lower LDL cholesterols and lower triglycerides in their blood, and they tend to have higher HDL cholesterol concentrations compared to individuals consuming westernized diets. So this data, fast forwarding now for the last say, 40 years, we've been looking at how these omega-3 fatty acids are beneficial especially when we link it to heart disease. And so you can see here in this graph, and this is a review done by Darius Mozafarian, um, published in 2006, but it's showing you the relative strength of the effect of either of DHA and EPA intake in milligrams per day, either in the typical dietary doses. So this is basically fish intake right here. Okay, so this is not from plant sources because you don't, their plant sources are very poor uh, to no EPA DHA. So this is basically fish consumption in the diet up to about 750 milligrams per day is what you could get from regular fish consumption. And then beyond this, this is typical supplementary doses. And so you can see that you can get, there is an anti-arithmetic effect. This it takes about a few weeks for this to become evident. And so, but this is achievable from dietary intakes. So switching to a higher fish intake. There is heart rate lowering, but again, plateaus out at dietary intake levels. There's BP lowering, blood pressure lowering. Again, plateaus out at roughly um, the higher end of the um, dietary dose. Triglyceride lowering, however, is a little bit different, and you can see that you do get more. The more you consume, the lower you can push your triglycerides. So individuals with hypertriglyceridemia can be um, prescribed EPA and DHA at, sub, at high doses and consume this to lower their triglycerides. <clears throat> this does take months to years to take effect, and it is dependent on regular consumption of the EPA DHA at the high levels. And then you can see again, for an antithrombosis effect, you do need high doses supplemental because it's not achievable through dietary sources. So this gives you a little picture of how we can achieve these overall heart healthy effects and most of these are achievable through dietary change without the need for supplementary omega-3s in the diet but i will draw your attention to what's missing from this slide and that's ldl concentrations you don't see that ldl concentrations are decreased on this slide because they're not most of the studies if not all of the studies that have been done with supplemental fish oil uh, or increasing fish intake do not improve the ldl concentrations uh, or the total hdl cholesterol ratio um, beyond slight increases in the HDL uh, that you would get from the higher fish consumption. So that's very interesting because that's telling that uh, the lower cholesterol levels that you see in the, in the Greenland Inuit are not specifically related to the omega-3 intakes, despite, the, I'll just go back to that slide. So this, is, this has been shown in epidemiological data that they have lower LDL cholesterol concentrations. But if you look at the interventionary intervention and clinical endpoint data that we've, that we've collected over the last, say, 40 years, that it doesn't link to LDL cholesterol concentrations. And a recent paper in Science has come out where they've looked at um, particular single nucleotide polymorphisms that appear in individuals from um, uh, Aboriginal descent in uh, Greenland and, and, and other northern communities. Uh, and what you see here is that they have a higher prevalence of a, of um, conserved single nucleotide polymorphisms that have the effect of changing the pathway of conversion from the plant sourced omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids that you get uh, in the diet through the meat and marine diet um, sourced um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And that being that these individuals have lower conversion of the fatty acids coming from marine uh, sources as well as meat sources in comparison to those from the plant sources which they would be traditionally poor on. So they have a high capacity for conversion uh, in the lower end of, the, of this these pathways but a uh, constriction at this level because in part this, this makes intuitive sense they have no um, uh, uh, metabolic demand because it is being met without a doubt through their dietary 
uh, intake. And so these changes have knock-on effects with other metabolic pathways. And so that's what this paper in particular, I'm not going to go into much detail with it because it's very complex, but the relationships that they were teasing out here were related more so to um, these overall whole body changes in the lipid conversion pathways uh, may be linked closer to their uh, uh, lower risk of heart disease. And so this is a, something that's been conserved over the last 25,000, 40,000 years in these populations. And so then if you just take the dietary component and then put it into other uh, backgrounds, so European descent uh, or, or uh, other parts of the world, um, Asian descent, let's say, you don't see the same effects to the same extent because of this particular genetic makeup and this particular um, set of expressions um, in the enzymes related to fatty acid conversion. And we actually had some of this data in a study we conducted looking at individuals consuming high levels of plant-based omega-3s, but we didn't realize at the time the data that we had, and only recently did we put it into context seeing this paper in Science, uh, and this is just showing you one of the slides from that particular paper. So we had healthy Western individuals uh, who had um, no underlying medical conditions, uh, aside from probably being on the higher end of the uh, BMI spectrum, so somewhere between overweight and obese. These individuals were genotyped for their FADS1 and 2, which are the fatty acid conversion enzymes. And what you see is here in this particular table that I'm showing you is that consuming a westernized diet, so this is westernized fat profile, the individuals with the wild type, um, uh, the wild type SNP for this particular um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, had, um, were converting, or sorry, had, had roughly, in terms of composition of their total fatty acids, about, you know, 0.6% um, uh, uh, EPA. But individuals carrying the lesser common SNP the C um, component here that you see in the bottom, whether they were consuming the westernized diet or high oleic corn oil, uh, or sorry, high oleic canola oil, they were producing about 50% of the EPA of those with the wild type genotype. And it w we weren't able to achieve the same levels of EPA in these individuals until they were consuming high levels of flaxseed oil, which is very rich in omega-3 um, fatty acids. Um, alpha linolenic acid, and here then you can see that they get up to the same level approximately or even higher, um, but it's only at this level that could we achieve this height uh, or this amount of conversion to EPA. Um, and this is interesting because at the time we looked at this as being these were under con these were low converters and maybe they require higher levels, um, but maybe this is not the case and we're actually probably going to go back and look at this data to see if there's anything else we can tease out of this in light of some of these new genetic studies which are coming out, um, identifying um, maybe protective aspects of, sorry, protective aspects of the um, flow through these pathways being constriction or reduction uh, in conversion as opposed to uh, producing more. And so, in summary, if you have any take-home message out of this, I hope that it's that dietary saturated fatty acids, right now it's not known or it's not proven that they have a direct independent effect on atherosclerotic vascular diseases. But they do, without a doubt, have a, an effect on LDL cholesterol concentrations. And they do have, and then these LDL cholesterol concentrations have a direct effect on atherosclerotic vascular diseases. And so this is the link that's present right now. And so when, that's why. It, infuriates me when I hear individuals referring to um, high fat diet, high saturated fat diets as being perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, as being nonsense and actually potentially dangerous. It's because of the direct effect that you see here and because the average person and the average food label doesn't break down fatty acids in a way that makes sense um, because it doesn't show how much of each of the individual fatty acids are present in the particular fat that the person is consuming. And so what's not well understood and what most of the current research right now in um, dietary saturated fat or fat intakes in general is going into is the direct effect of each individual saturated fat, the amount or ratio of that particular saturated fat in the diet, and then the ratio between the saturated MUFA and PUFA in the diet, and then how that links in with the overall macronutrient profile. And so 
I'm saying that it's it's not really present in our particular uh, case here in uh, the UK or in Canada or the US where we can have access to this data on food labels in terms of what types of fatty acids are present uh, in the in the breakdown of these oils and the breakdowns of the foods we have but some countries are doing it so for take for example France they actually have recommendations for the individual fatty acids as well as their total saturated fatty acid intake so they recommend lower intakes of uh, lower meristic and palmitic acid and they have caps on those as well as a cap on total saturated fatty acid in the diet so some countries are doing it but it's difficult to do because it's translating that information to the general public is what is difficult and until they understand or have a good a good understanding of what it means to consume a particular saturated fat it's very difficult for people to really grasp how they're supposed to change their diet appropriately so with that, I'll leave you with uh, a question. Do you feel that you're a single nutrient uh, villain supporter or are you a whole diet hero, someone who promotes whole diet or dietary patterns? And the reason I ask you this is because this is basically what it distills down to in the public message, that it's, uh, is there a single nutrient that we should be banning and that's a villain? And we've seen all the nutrients go through this. Saturated fat has been through the ringer. Total fat's been through the ringer. Carbs have been through the ringer. Now it's just added sugar going through the ringer. So are you the person that promotes that type of approach or are you somebody who promotes uh, advocation of a diet pattern? And I hope you're the latter because the uh, I'd like you just to just tease out of this in terms of foods that you're probably going to consume today yourself, uh, maybe for lunch, maybe you already consumed some of these for breakfast. Um, how to tease out of this which foods are healthy and which foods are not because they have range a, a wide range of total um, fat, a wide range of total calorie and they have a wide range of fatty acid distribution across them. But this is what the average person is faced with. So thank you very much. And I apologize for not being able to attend in person. Um, I think Allison may have made it made you aware, but I've uh, recently moved back to Canada. Um, I still hold an appointment at King's, um, but I'm not uh, physically based in um, the UK anymore. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask in the session later today. Uh, or if you'd like, you can email me directly and I'll reply and I'll uh, probably copy in Allison and she can distribute any answers to questions to the entire group um, if, they're, uh, if it's that sort of question that everybody may benefit from. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.